Hello. Um, sorry. First of all, just thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be here. I know so many people, which is so nice. I didn't realize I would know. And I also think this place is very special. Um, I've been here two times before, and I always feel really good here. I can't totally explain why. I'm going to talk to you today for a half an hour, no more, about um, my favorite topic to talk about. It's not all that we do, but it's a big part of what Weitzner does and what I love very close to my heart, which is um, handmade for the modern world. Um, so just to give you a very quick background, I went to Syracuse. I was a painting major. I wanted to be a painter. My professor said, what are you going to do to make a living? And I said, I'm going to be a painter. And he said, what are you going to do to make a living? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be a painter. And he said, you're not good enough. And then he said, and even if you were, you're not going to make a living. So you should become a textile designer because you have a good sense of color and composition. I hated him, <laughs> but I honor him now, even though he's long dead, because I never looked back. And I switched my major, and I major in textile design, and for me, it fulfilled my soul. And I have to say, we're all pretty lucky sitting in this room. My husband's in insurance business. We're really lucky to be in a world <laughs> doing what we do. So let's begin. Growing up, um, I always had the travel bug, and I was very fortunate to have parents who took me. We never did sports. I can't do any sports at all, but I've seen a lot of the world. And we lived in Westchester, a suburb of New York City, and every Sunday my dad would take me to the museum. My passport, I have lots of stamps I'm very proud of. I've saved them all. And um, I um, go to flea markets wherever I travel and collect things. Um, when I would go on Sundays with my dad to the Met, uh, I had this feeling that if I were to touch a piece of art or textile or something that I saw hanging on the wall, I would become closer to that artist that actually made it. And I would always watch for the guard, and as soon as the guard turned his head, I would creep over and put my hand on it. And I felt as if I was touching, there was some kind of connection. It may sound, some of my talk, by the way, may sound a little over the top, but I don't care. Um, yeah, that was an ugly period. <laughs> Traveling on little planes in the middle of nowhere with my parents, my first trip to Paris in front of Galleries Lafayette with my sister. Isn't that a stylish coat? Um, looking miserable with my father, because we also went to nature places. and. Um, my parents weren't that fun to travel with, actually. <laughs> but it was beautiful. That was Canada, northern Canada, the Middle East. Then I, that was the first trip after college where I just went. And I went everywhere, and I went on my own. And um, it was fantastic. Sometimes it was scary. Sometimes I was lonely. But more of the time, I was fascinated with the people, but also the work that I saw created by people where I went. And this is where I had a very life-changing experience in Africa. Um, my boyfriend of college moved to Singapore and asked me to come and see if I would live there with him. And I went, and I did not like Singapore at all. If I offend anybody, I'm sorry, because I felt that I couldn't find soul there. But instead, I went and traveled everywhere around Singapore, Malaysia and uh, other places. And there, I was just. And the definition of awesome, wonder, you know, I never really, I use the word awesome a lot, but it wasn't until I went there that I understood what awesome really meant. Um, pretty beautiful. When I can't travel, bookstores, they are the next best thing. And to go to bookstores, which disappeared for a while but are coming back, to go there when you have nothing else to do, where you don't have your cell phone and you don't have an agenda, it's a journey of its own for a few hours. And that's where I find a lot of inspiration. Uh, keeping all our senses open. So wherever you go, whether it's in your own backyard or whether it's somewhere very exotic, I like to always remind people to notice the details. I'm just, these are just, I'm flooding you with inspiration right now. Um, just notice the details. 
whether it's from something that someone's making, or the color of the grass, or the way the rain feels on you. We're so busy all the time. Whether you live in New York City like me or you live anywhere, we're busy. And unfortunately, technology has made us even busier or more easily distracted. So try and make sure that every day you can pause wherever you are and look. And when you travel and you take your pictures, especially now when we don't always print them out, make sure at least once a month you revisit them and remind yourself or put up a bulletin board where you can put up what has inspired you through the ages. Keep those things alive. I love that photo and that one. The detail of all of these things have all been inspiration. That has led up to what is my favorite part of the work that I do, working with artisans around the world. So first off is identifying the potential. Entering a country that you are not sure you're able to work with because we're all running companies where we have to produce product that we can actually have color matching and things that can live in a line for, if we're lucky, even 20 years. What's the definition of artisan? A person that makes a high quality, distinctive product, usually by hand and using traditional methods. Definition of innovation, the act or process of inventing or introducing something new. Business, an enterprise involved in the trade of goods, services, or both purposefully activity. This is an important word in the steps. Viable. Unfortunately, I didn't become the fine artist. I became someone who's a designer in business, so it's got to be practical or worthwhile and able to grow. And sustainable, which is a word we throw out all the time, I like this definition. It's simple, it's succinct, the capacity to support, maintain, or endure. We can take that in many ways. <clears throat> So those are the five words you need to know before you enter into any kind of collaboration. Objectives for making it work. This is my little, don't worry, this is not a heavy business lecture at all, but the holistic business model is what I like to call it. And this is from my experience to date, identifying the potential in that country. And I'm gonna give you lots of examples, so don't worry. Communication, if you can't communicate appropriately, it's never going to work. It's like a relationship, it's a marriage. And um, eventually it doesn't work if you're not on the same wavelength. Now that communication can happen with assistance, of course. The ability to understand market require, I just realized I keep looking there and I can look here. <laughs> the ability to understand market requirements. We all live in that world now. And I love that world. And going back to my professor who said I shouldn't be a fine artist, I'm so glad also because Creating work for myself, it would be satisfying, but creating work that actually people enjoy and want to buy and use and will make them happy in their homes or their environments kind of is a lot more exciting to me. The ability to evolve the design. When you talk about the artisan and the innovation and having them meet, um, and what you know, Pamela was talking about earlier, the interpretation of these magnificent artisanal products from ancient times up through, that's what gets me going and that's what's exciting and that's what these artisans needs because that's what's gonna make these products sustainable into the future. And of course, an interested partner. So if you've got those things, you can do a lot of really cool, great stuff. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of some of my journeys. So come with me for a few minutes. I'm gonna start with Japan. Japan is a very interesting country. Japan is an expensive country. Japan is very technologically um, astute, and you can do some pretty cool things there. It's also incredibly inspiring. Have a lot of you been to Japan? Yes, okay. Um, cherry blossom season, I always try and go during that time. It's pretty beautiful. The people I find there incredibly graceful, a little, excuse me, a little bit challenging to communicate with, um, and I'm not sure still whether it's shyness or just the communication or a private, that they're more private than Americans and me because I talk about like everything. Um, <clears throat> I kind of like it and wish I could be more like them that way and not just blab everything that I'm thinking. But um, 
it's interesting because that is a challenge when you want to know where you stand. You want to know, can this be done? And they kind of just sort of bow a little bit. We work with a number of mills um, where we produce our wallpapers and also some fabrics. And a lot of the parts are handmade and some of them are machine done. And what we find is the combination of both actually move the product to the next level. We're working with all kinds of yarns. We're learning how to hand make paper, beautiful papers, handmade papers in Japan that we use as grounds for our product. Um, they let us play a little bit with when we're there. And then we try and do out of the box things. Do you guys know what those leaves are? Yes. They're tea, very good. Not there's, and those are tea leaves and green tea leaves. And there's an abundance of them in Japan. So we decided to take flocking in a new direction and flock with tea leaves. So that's a wall covering that we've done. So it's also thinking out outside the box. How long has flocking been in existence? But I'm not sure if anybody's flocked with tea leaves before. It's actually lovely for about three months when it's installed, it still smells like tea. Uh, foil print on very special Japanese papers, embroideries that, that are paper backed. Embroideries can be done in many countries, but if you want it for wall covering and it has to be installed in a very precise way, Japan is the place to go for that. This is another flocking technique that the Japanese do beautifully and just some printed wall coverings to give you a taste. The United States is absolutely on my list and when I give this talk people are like, oh, you work in the United States with artisans too? How do you afford to do that? Well, we have some people here we can work with, absolutely, and um, we have a wonderful group of women that do all gilding for us um, because part of our goal with our wall covering collection is to give you not just one type of product, but to work with really innovative materials and mix them up and shake them up and surprise you. So we may have these handmade beautiful papers from Japan and these flockings and embroideries, but on the other hand, we want to play with gold leaf. And the only best way to do it is with the hand. So we have these wonderful artisans that are brushing and stamping and we've come up with, um, this is older now, and what's really cool about it is we started to think about wall covering in an innovative way. Everybody has wallpaper and they hang it on the wall. But why can't the wall and the paper interact with each other? How about a wall covering that has holes, for example, paint the wall any color, hang this on top, and then there's an engagement between the two. When we launched the product, we thought nobody's going to buy it, nobody's going to understand it. But in the end, um, it's been one of our best sellers because our client, who is creative, loves the idea of a challenge as well and loves to take a product and somehow make it their own. And here's just some examples of how that can be done. Another thing we thought about was, okay, how can our client have more impact in what material looks like? And so we created a malleable plaster, soft, on paper that we apply with stencils. You put it on the wall, white, it comes only white, and you paint it any way you want. So the client can make it very personal. We play with embossings, and we've made hand embossings, and those are just an example of things from the United States. And now we're gonna to move to the Philippines, which is one of my favorite countries to work in. The materials, you've gotta work with the materials inherent to the country, that's the first big step and um, we work with a group of women hand weavers in an island near Manila um, that are the most beautiful women I've ever met and they are um, <clears throat> people who could have maybe had to be waiter, waitresses or bus drivers but they wanted to really continue to do what they learned growing up which was their craft to keep it alive, these hand weaving and because of our clients who enjoy our work, we've been able to employ, I want to keep 100 hand weavers busy doing product made with abaca, which is banana fiber and silk, and weave these magnificent layerings that then go to Japan and get paper backed on beautiful colors, and then they become a really lovely product. This is abaca again, which I love working with abaca. It's coarse and hairy and wonderful and we do special weaves and then layer them on color ground, all becoming 
really beautiful high end wall covering for us. These women are beautiful. They're happy when we go visit. They're so excited to see pictures of how people have used their product. They're proud. And I hope that, that we can keep that going. We also work in the Philippines with recycled materials, silago and mulberry and pulp, and we make paper. And um, <clears throat> this is a very special place with family that we love in a village. And sometimes when we get those big orders, we have to hire 20 or 30 more people to come in and do them. And it is pure and interesting. Everything they do. Has anybody here handmade paper before? It's such a wonderful process. It's so beautiful. We're just doing this on a level where we're selling our product to win casinos and uh, the Ritz-Carlton. So you can take a handmade product that a family of beautiful people in the Philippines are making, and it can end up in a place like that. So um, that's very exciting for everyone. Um, these are just some examples of how they make it. They actually literally take ketchup bottles with the wet pulp, and then it goes in a giant, they have an oven about half the size of this room that dries the paper. We just had a problem, and this is something that you have to take into account when you work with artisans. We had a huge order that needed to be delivered by a certain time, but the rainy season started, and it's very hard for the paper to dry when it's raining so much, and there's only so many that can fit in the oven. There are those kind of challenges. When um, we had the typhoon a few years ago, the abaca fields were completely destroyed. And my fancy schmancy designer in New York doesn't really care. <laughs> we got smart with one of them. I won't mention him, but someone all of you know who was not very nice or happy. We took a video of how all this gets made, and then we took a video of the rains with the sound of the rains. And we sent it to him. And he said, whatever it takes, don't worry. So I think sometimes also in our world, people are really busy. And they don't mean to not be nice, but they don't have the time to stop and really think. So we want to make them think. So we show a lot of the background, because it gives a sense of soul and appreciation to how these things get made. And these become some of the final products. I just have to tell you this one quick story. I'm still good on time, don't worry. I um, needed new shoes, and I went into Saks Fifth Avenue, and I fell in love with the most gorgeous pair of Manolo Blahnik shoes you can imagine. Do you guys know what that cost? That's like a rent, a month's rent. And I'm staring at these shoes because we all love beautiful design, and I'm thinking, can I, can I? No, I can't. But then I turned around, and there was my product <laughs> displayed at Saks, and I said, it's a sign. <laughs> I'm buying these shoes. And I bought the shoes. But it is very exciting to see where these are made from the beginning point of the banana leaf all the way through where the abaca or mulberry bush is collected to this, to these beautiful interiors. And what people, creative people, are doing with all these wonderful things. It's so exciting. So this is just giving you a taste of what can be done in the Philippines. Abaca, that's what it looks like once it dries. We did a beautiful product. We were talking about macrame last night. This is a kind of modern type of macrame. I don't know where Kimberly is, but. And then taking it further. And also with the passamentary design line for Samuel and Sons, we work also in the Philippines with their woods and their beads. All of those tassel, those fringe tassels you see are made. India, can't talk about this without talking about India. You walk through the markets. Everything is just so intense that sometimes you really need to take a break from it. Everything from the gorgeous, magnificent, vibrant colors to the overripe fruit smells to the sweat. Sheen, I don't usually sweat, but when I'm there, boy, do I sweat. You can do magnificent things, taking old techniques and making them new. Clamp dyes, everybody knows clamp dyes. You just, it's so simple. It's like batik, this wood clamps on and you dye the fabric. But then it becomes this beautiful, contemporary, very sophisticated product. That's quite something. Um, newspaper. Recycling newspaper from all over the world, hand weaving it, and making it into wall covering. This is one of our um, most well-known and successful wall coverings. We um, started with two hand weavers, two, in India. We are now up to 40. We've gone on to do maps 
and we've also done cinema posters, and they sell in great places. Um, Newsworthy is in the, um, all of Google headquarters, for example, and it's in Will Ferrell's home. <laughs> so the span is quite amazing. And when we launched it, I thought, I just think it's cool, but nobody's going to buy it. Maps, cinema posters. Cut and sew, this was a, a, a plastic casement to honor light, all done in India. Thailand, one of the bigger challenges. I love Thailand, but I was invited by the government to come and tour Thailand to see how I can help them do more product um, commercially, internationally. It's the most magnificent country, but it was challenging because, oh, what happened? Ooh, Department of Cultural Affairs Wireless Network, accept. <laughs> Um, anyway, just the reason why Thailand was so challenging is because they're so steeped in tradition, they're afraid to try something new. Thank you. Um, and we talked before about artisan innovation. You need that, what India has, what the Philippines has, what Japan has, you need to be willing to push the envelope, and they were afraid of that. So the inspiration there is rampant, magnificent. The silk, we of course, did and have in our collection Thai silk, because Thai silk is amazing and special with its um, irregular, you, the humidity is part of what makes Thai silk so beautiful and because they feed them pure mulberry. So um, it's kind of like the not fast food silk. <laughs> um, these are people weaving for us and this was what we did, but you can't do Thai silk forever. And by the way, Jim Thompson really has that market in a big way, so how can we mix it up? It took a long time to get them to do something different for us. Um, and finally, they came up with a yarn that they almost didn't show me because they didn't think it was appropriate that was swept up from all the selvage in the, loom, in the mill of, of these silk waste products and then throw them into machines, spin them into a yarn, frizzy hair in Thailand, um, and then it became a great fabric. And when the owner of this mill showed this yarn to me and she saw my face and she was the daughter. She said, my mother did, who owned the mill did not want me to show this to you. She thought it was almost like sacrilegious to the tradition. So I found that's where I was with Thailand. I still think there's a huge amount of potential there, but in a way more challenging. And Nepal <coughs> is my last of this. Oh my God, Nepal has been amazing and they've been through so much and they just keep persevering. And these are our beautiful, we work with some beautiful people there doing wonderful woven um, <clears throat> papers, wall coverings. We wanted something that was metal, but you can't really weave with metal, because you can, but it's combustible. The only place where you can do that really is in the military. So we wrapped foil around paper products. We mixed jute, which they have and, and use a lot there, with Lurex. They brought in a Lurex yarn. So all of a sudden, it's like a contrast in you know, the high-low. It's the matte and shine. This is one of a beautiful one called Cezanne. Watercolor wash on paper, cut up strips, and then hand woven. Why? Why do we do this? Why do I do this? Why do I love doing this? I'm going to tell you. Some of it's obvious, because you're creating beautiful products is really good business. We know that. And I loved what Pamela said in her talk about you know, it, it shines through the authenticity and the integrity of when you develop something. And when I have designers visit my studio or I do a presentation for them, they know and, and they can feel it. <clears throat> Helping artisans to maintain a sustainable life is pretty awesome. I'm pretty proud that we went from two hand weavers to 42 hand weavers. I'm pretty proud that when we get, are able to nab a big hotel project, that that village is so busy hiring extra people to hand make paper. It's really wonderful. Um, this is the most important, in my opinion, especially now in 2015. The handmade is critical to keeping us human and connected. And I do not say that lightly. I think that we are in danger in a lot of ways, and we need to pull back. It's what I said before about pausing in your day, no matter how busy you are, no matter how many companies you run, to notice the detail of things and to take in how the light and shadow hits us. And when you travel and you take those pictures, to look at them again and again and not just have them filed away forever. But there is something we need as humans, and that's a connection. 
And walking around all day like this with our iPhones is not doing that. I have, I, I'm, a, I'm a, I, t I mean, I'm, I'm doing it too, so I'm not like this woo person. I get, I know that we need it. Honestly, I'm not, but this is pretty important, and that's why I do it. And the other last final thing that I'm going to close with is just a few pictures of my family who have helped make Whitesner like such an awesome, I think, company. Hi, Lori. I know you. Yeah. How do you find your sources? That's a secret I can't yeah. reveal. Oh. I'm um, just you curious, know what? No, seriously, like that's they're... a great question. And I got to tell you, I am old. And I've been doing this for a really long time. And there is no magic ball that tells you how to make these sources. But it did begin with when I worked for Jack Larson. I mean, Jack Larson's my mentor. I worked for him and designed for him. And he was the pioneer. And in, in honesty, none of us would be doing what we're doing in textile without him. And he traveled the globe before anyone else did collecting. And um, he taught me a lot about where to find and where to look. And then from there, I went, continued on. It's sort of being in the right place, meeting people. It's very serendipitous. OK, who else did you? Laurie, that was great. We're Thank you. jumping for joy over here. Um, you've done so much, and it seems like you're living your dream, but what's, what's something that you want to accomplish next? Oh, God. Um, in design or in, like, my coming home in a good mood? You know, I yeah, mean? Yeah, <laughs> it can be. It can be in design, I'd like to, you know, last year the question was asked, and I said, I want to write a book. And it came true, and I, I have a book that I've written. So now I think, honestly, I would love to design jewelry. But I don't know how, you know, this profession is like very insular. Like, I don't know how you go, I don't know anyone in jewelry. If anyone knows anyone in jewelry, <laughs> you do. Oh, okay, I'll talk to you later. No, I, I would love to design jewelry. That's, that's something. And then that's, that's a work thing. And personally, um, I would like to be, um, I'd like to listen to more to what I say. Because I know it's true, but I also get stuck, and I, I don't pause enough. 